Oh boy. Ooh. Good afternoon and hope we're all having a great time. It's been very educational. We even have a uh, colonel with a sense of humor. Where are we at? He's great. We said Mr. Colonel has a sense of humor. I don't think you heard me. There, now here, there you go. Just. Um, so you have on your table a uh, magnifying glass by the Summit logo here in the middle. Everyone see that magnifying glass? So if you pick it up, you designate an important person to do that who's qualified, um, you'll see a, uh, a logo on this right here of the Water Summit inside one of these circles right here. If I explain that correctly. A, a hidden Summit logo. Does anyone see that? No yet? The, I'll tell you more, the, the, the Summit logo is on to the left hand side like at uh, what, 7 o'clock where it says a reused recycled water. Do I, do I have any takers that see that? Right here? Any takers? Anyone say bingo? All right, there we go. So now that we've all found that, we're, we're, we're working on it. You, 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 there is a prize involved. And if you have that at your table, underneath the table you'll find some books. And those books are complimentary as our, as, as, as our guests. We want to thank you. It's either Let There Be Water by our luncheon speaker, C. Siegel, or a copy of The Water 4.0 by the morning speaker, David Sed Sedlak. So did you find the books? Did, it, did, it, did you find the books that, that said bingo? Okay, I'm going to say you did. So, moving on, on behalf of Jeff Thomas and myself, we want to thank you again for coming. And Jeff and I are going to say a few words. And also, I think we want to do is give a big hand, a big hand to Fritz Coleman, who's just done a fabulous job. Thank you very much. There you go. Jeff, wanna... What a terrific day. I gotta tell you, this is one of my very favorites we've done. I wanna thank the staff of both MODOC and OCWD, the tireless work. I know a lot of them got here at like four and five o'clock in the morning in order to bring this on. I really wanna thank them for all the hard work they did. Fritz's appearance would not have been made possible without the support of NBC. We have a brief clip from the station. Uh, it's going to be an NBC4 promo. Do we have that queued up? Buckle up. Our 4x4 caster was just the beginning. Now, this NBC4 team's building a new live Doppler network, taking weather coverage from accurate to untouchable. Our NBC4 live Doppler network is on full alert this afternoon. Delivering unmatched reach and reliability. And we're not stopping there. This one-of-a-kind truck has Doppler on board, cruising every corner of SoCal. Most importantly, yours. It's the difference between other forecasts and our future cast. NBC4's total Doppler domination. I want a Doppler Dominator. That, that's, I want one of those trucks. That should be standard issue for all of us. That's awesome. Anyway, so for Fritz today, now that he's here, we have a small token of our appreciation and want to give you a, a number of gifts here. You can wear them now or later if you like. <laughs> but thank you very much, Fritz. Thank you very much. The podium is it's all yours honor. again. It's my honor. Thank, thank you, you, fellows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Give them a big hand, everybody. Thank please. you. Yes, I'm your Doppler dominatrix here for the afternoon. <laughs> well, we have a little change in the program today, but it won't make this gentleman's impact any less. We're so happy he could he, uh, be here via Skype. Our, Our keynote, keynote speaker, speaker Seth, Seth Siegel, Siegel became very Ill, Ill, and his doctors have grounded him from air travel, and he's back east in New York right now. But the consummate professional that he is, Seth is going to be video conferencing in to give us a brief presentation, and he'll, he'll take, take a few, a few questions. questions. And, and after, after Seth, Seth speaks, our five, five panelists will join on the stage. Seth, Seth is a writer, writer 
an lawyer, an activist, a serial entrepreneur. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Let There Be Water, Israel's Solution for a Water-Starved World, which is now in print in 13 languages. His essays on water and other issues have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and leading publications in Europe and Asia. Seth is the Daniel M. Soriff Senior Water Policy Fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences. He's also Senior Advisor to Startup Nation Central, an Israeli nonprofit that connects government, NGO, and business leaders to the relevant people, companies, and technologies in Israel. Seth is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's spoken on water issues around the world and at more than 200 venues in 60 cities, including Congress, the United Nations, the World Bank, Davos, and at Google's headquarters, and at about 30 major college campuses, including Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Yale, and Stanford. He is the co-founder of several companies, including Beanstalk, the world's leading trademark brand extension company, which he sold to Ford Motor Company. He was also a producer of the Tony Award-nominated Broadway revival of Man of La Mancha. Seth sits on the board of several not-for-profit organizations. All of the profits from the sales of Let There Be Water are being donated to charity. That's an amazing accomplishment. Please welcome Seth M. Siegel. Seth, good to see you. Thank you very much, and I do apologize to everyone that you have to see me electronically. I was uh, excited about coming. I, uh, like many of you, have seen Dr. Sedlak's book, and I'd never met him in person, and I wanted to uh, do so. I, you have an amazing list of speakers, uh, but, uh, but, you know, uh, man plans and God laughs, I think the old expression is, and, uh, and I have a zealous doctor, and I have a zealous wife, and uh, when the doctor said no flying, my wife, uh, my wife uh, grounded me uh, for this week, so I'm really sorry not to be there. I will just say, very in passing, I think lots of us uh, who care about our water quality are concerned about the uh, degree that antibiotics get into our water supply. But this week, I was rooting for the antibiotics, I have to say. And uh, thank God uh, they've uh, done a good job uh, uh, getting rid of a cough that would have otherwise made this uh, pretty painful presentation for you all. So in the few minutes that I have and before we open it up to a couple of questions, let me tell you about the book and what it stands for and what I tried to say with it all. And that is that uh, about five years ago or so, the U.S. government issued a uh, declassified but originally top secret report that said that, the, that they believed with a high degree of certainty that some 60 percent of the world's landmass and some billions of people would be experiencing severe or significant, at a minimum, significant to severe water scarcity by the year 2025. And this was going to have, they projected, profound impacts on water, uh, on, on pricing of food around the world. It would set off social instability. It might lead, they said, to the uh, rise of failed states around the world, and that it could even result in the a change in U.S. defense architecture, costing mega billions of dollars and even maybe trillions of dollars. And that's even before getting into issues like uh, massive humanitarian flows of a kind that, frankly, we have never experienced before, uh, not even in the aftermath of World War II. I began, um, uh, as you heard from the introduction, I'm kind of a communal activist. I care a lot about foreign policy issues. And over the past uh, handful of months following learning about that report, I began reading as deeply as I could about solutions to this. And I was actually quite shocked that one solution after the next would be found in Israel. And the reason why I was shocked was I had been to Israel. Some of you may have already been to Israel as well. And what you learn after moments after landing is that most of the country is a desert. About two thirds of the country is a desert. The rest of the country is semi-arid. Uh, they've been a terrible victim of, of uh, climate change, about a 25, 30% of the natural water from rain uh, that was coming as recently as 25, 30 years ago has diminished. The country is the fastest growing population in the entire world over the past 60, 70 years. 
It's a tenfold increase in national population. And they have an extraordinary and very dynamic economy. In fact, other than Singapore and South Korea over the past 50 years, no other country equals Israel in its economic growth. So if you think of the indicia of water crisis, generally you think of, okay, climate change, check. Rapid population growth, check. Rapid economic activity, check. And those types of uh, events generally lead to great scarcity of water. But in the case of Israel, I learned to my amazement that there was not only not a shortage of water, and we're talking about a country in the most, uh, in the most water scarce region in the world, that not only does Israel not have a scarcity of water, but that the opposite, that Israel has such an abundance of water that they are completely self-sufficient in the growing of fruits and vegetables and other food products. They, um, they are able to have 24-7 reliable, safe, clean, healthy water, just like you do in, in Irvine or Anaheim or Los Angeles or London or New York, which is very rare, as those, those of you know, the international water picture know, is very rare around the world. Only about 10 percent of the world's population enjoys that kind of 24-7 safe water. And, and in addition to all that, I learned that Israel provides more than half of the water that the Palestinians in the West Bank and much of the water the Palestinians in Gaza and the Jordanians in the Kingdom of Jordan make use of comes from Israeli sources. And I found that quite amazing. So I, I began uh, digging into this. I spent an enormous amount of time in Israel. I ended up interviewing some of people multiple times, but inter interviewing 220 people, 180 Israelis involved with the story. Uh, uh, 20 Palestinians and 20 U.S. government officials to try to get a rounded story. And after that reportage, uh, after that interviewing, I did some other reporting, other research and archival material and, um, and found out as much as I could about the story. So I want to share with you the how of all of this. How did Israel, how were they able to put all of this together? And, um, and, 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 and for a world that is ever drier, what this could be, I think, is something very exciting, is it could be a model for the world in need. And, and so I'll try to put this into very succinct buckets. Those of you who are interested, the book Let There Be Water tells the story uh, in more detail. I tried to write it in a very popular manner, and I think that I was rewarded for that uh, by it becoming a, a bestseller in the United States and, and the many uh, wonderful editions around the world. Um, and so I, I, it's not a scary book or an environmentally challenging book or an engineering book for engineers only kind of book. It's a, written for liberal arts majors. So he, he, here's, here's what the key ideas are. So what did Israel do? First of all, Israel developed a water revering culture. In America, even in water dry places, we're quite schizophrenic. You know, in Southern California, on the one hand, we talk about water scarcity. On the other hand, we have green lawns, we have golf courses, we have swimming pools. You know, it's part of a California lifestyle, the abundance of water, and, and you create kind of a, a, a cognitive, constant cognitive dissonance for consumers. But in Israel, they did something different. They developed a real water-revering culture that established the mindset of everybody that um, there's all the water people need, but people should never be reckless with their water on any level. And that culture permeated the thinking that led to be willing to have other sacrifices for the society and for the benefit of, the, of a better water future. And I give two specific examples. One is that in much of the United States, the water authorities are political. Uh, the appointments are political. The, uh, the uh, management is political. Certainly the pricing is political. In Israel, it's completely apolitical. Um, uh, once in every five years, a designated cabinet minister appoints the water commissioner. And then thereafter, for the next five years, water is controlled by this apolitical, technocratic body called the Israel Water Authority. The other great um, decision made because of the ability to sacrifice, the decision was made some years ago that everybody should pay the absolutely real price for water, 100 percent unsubsidized by any government uh, intrusion whatsoever. So there's no government subsidies for infrastructure. There's no government uh, loan support. Everybody pays the real price for water. And as we know from market economics, that when people pay the real price for their, for their goods or services, whatever it is, you become smarter about it and more careful about it. And I think that that's a, an interesting model for the world. In, in addition, Israel um, has done some wonderful things in technology. Israel, as many of you may know, is the center of where drip irrigation was invented. And for those of you who don't know about it, I, I would argue that if there's anything that we could do 
that would change the water profile of much of the world. It would be to move away from flood irrigation, even even sprinkler or center pivot irrigation, and move it towards drip irrigation wherever possible. We need to have some changed policies in the United States to do that. Loan guarantees and and uh, opportunities for farmers who rent their land to know that they'll be able to recover their investment in buying drip irrigation equipment that's made to last 15, 20, or 25 years, and other things like that. In addition, in agriculture, Israel, because of the fact that agriculture absorbs such an enormous amount of the fresh water of a society, Israel made other choices, one of which is they developed a, a, a world-renowned seed breeding industry. They're one of the five great seed breeding centers of the world now, along with the U.S., France, Holland, and Japan. And none of this is GMO uh, seeds that Israel uses. They use normally bred uh, seeds, but they have developed drought-resistant seeds that require less water and special seeds that thrive on brackish or salty water so that marginal water can be used to grow their food. Um, in addition, Israel by far and away leads the world in the reuse of water. Of course, the Orange County Water District uh, is a model for all of the United States, and I'm writing another water book right now, which I hope very much to uh, make the Orange County Water District one of the heroes of the story. But uh, there's nowhere in the world that does what Israel does. Israel captures just about all of its sewage, treats it all, and then reuses close to 90 percent of that sewage, not for drinking water, because they think psychologically people won't enjoy that, but they then go through an elaborate treatment system. The water is as pure as any water could possibly be. And then they have a parallel national water infrastructure system that they built out. And I hasten to add, they built this out not when they became wealthy. They started this in 1952 when the country was absolutely bankrupt, obsessed with its national security issues, obsessed with the absorption of immigrants. The country doubled in size from 48 to 52. And despite all that, the country was able to find its way to um, to build out this parallel national water infrastructure system that cost them billions of dollars. And the other thing they did in the early 1950s was to begin thinking about desalination. Now, not every single part of desalination was invented in Israel, but a very large part of it was. And that's because of the fact that beginning in the 1950s, uh, the then leader of Israel began, a lot of people thought he was just dreaming, but he, if you read his diaries, which I did do, you discover that the opposite is that he really thought of this in pragmatic terms, that the only way Israel would solve its water problems ultimately is if it was able to, to use his phrase, to desalt the sea. And that, of course, is where desalination, um, another way of calling desalinated water. And he, he put an enormous amount of energy and effort of a country that didn't have much money but had a lot of smart scientists. And he put them to work and engineers to work thinking about how they might be able to find a way to desalt the sea. And today, the cheapest lowest carbon using desalinated water in the world, and the largest desalination water plant in the world is from Israel, and the largest in the Western Hemisphere is from that same Israeli uh, desalination company, IDE, that built it out, in, uh, out near San Diego. Um, I, I'll just, because I've been asked to speak briefly to leave a lot of time for questions, I just want to end with two quick uh, final remarks, and that is that um, it's sometimes people think of, of um, these as either or water is either or either you're going to spend a lot of money and get consumers angry either or you're going to have good water but you're going to screw up your environment either or you're going to do well for yourself in water but you're going to have hostile neighbors and I want to share with you that excuse me <coughs> I want to share with you that Israel sorry I want to share with you that Israel actually has the best environmental picture it has had. In, uh, even since the founding of the state of Israel, it's, it, all of its rivers but one is healthier than it has ever been um, since the state was founded, and that is because there's more water flowing. And as important, and this is actually a very hopeful final piece, Israel has found a way to use its water as a tool for diplomacy, for outreach, coordination, cooperation, and even sometimes peace. Everybody in this audience surely knows historically that Israel has been a di diplomatically isolated country. And as I talk about it for about a third of my book in a section called Hydro Diplomacy, what Israel has done with water is simply remarkable. It has opened doors to countries previous to the uh, fall of the Shah, to the Iran. It's the reason it has diplomatic relations with China and India is because of its water technology and water expertise. Just in the past year, seven African nations have formed diplomatic relations with Israel. Uh, turning it, their back on the Arab boycott of Israel so that they can get access to Israel's water 
technology and water training. And that is a very hopeful story for those of us who labor in the world of water and sometimes wonder, I suspect, is there a larger message? And in this case, indeed, I think there is. So, Fritz, I'm going to toss it back to you, as you broadcasting folks say, I think, and uh, be glad to take any question of anyone in the audience. Well, that was fantastic, Seth. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Give him a big round of applause, if you would, folks. Uh, Seth, I found it interesting that since the 50s, um, Israel mandated that no water could flow from a well or into a home or a business or a farm without first going through a meter. Yes. In California, we still have areas that are not metered. Tell us what Israel is doing with all the data they collect from the metered system. Sorry. I apologize. Um, well, first of all, just think about how remarkable that is. That 1954, they passed a national law that says, what, that you just quoted the law basically, and, and that no water can pass from point A to point B, whether to a farm, to a home, to a business, to a hotel, with a manufacturing facility without it going through a meter. Now this is before the age of big computers, certainly the phrase uh, big data hadn't been invented yet, and I was able to meet with some very aged, uh, mostly men, a few women, uh, to ask them what did they have in mind. And what they had in mind was that they knew that someday that data was going to be of enormous value to them and that they would be able to predict patterns and be able to use that data to plan out how to grow their system because that would produce predictive nature for them. Now, imagine today with our supercomputers and our big data how fabulous it would be if everyone everywhere were metered so that we could have similar predictability. By the way, I also add another benefit of metering, and that's why a lot of people don't want to be metered, is because of, of the fact that it, it often leads to government charges. But the primary reason for Israel was not to charge for it. It was because they had a sense that more information and more, uh, more knowledge would only redound to their benefit. And so there's always a cost in anything you do. And, and there's a huge warehouse filled with hand filled out, you know, handwritten pieces of paper, which I had a chance to see going back to the 50s, that reported on water usage. And they managed to take that and synthesize that into part of the water miracle that is Israel today. By the way, I was I was corrected many times by Israelis to say that, you know, it is the Holy Land. And I, I would say the water miracle, they'd say miracles come from God. And God was our partner, they would say, but it was at the activity of people that created what we created here, and which is, I think, also a hopeful statement for the world at large. Uh, you, you already mentioned this a couple of times in your presentation, but we'll drill down on it a little bit. You write that less than, this is a pretty amazing statistic, 20% of the world's fields utilize irrigation, and the rest rely on rainfall. But about 80% of the fields that are irrigated are using some form of ancient and wasteful flood irrigation methods. Israel, as you said, changed all that. Talk about some of the ways other countries are switching subsidized water with subsidized things like drip irrigation and, and the, the model that Israel put forth. Sure, I'd love to. Uh, by the way, I also hasten to add that since I think it's either 1973 or 74, but somewhere in the 70s, uh, uh, flood irrigation is now illegal in Israel. You are not permitted to do that. And the reason for that is, uh, for those in the audience who may not know this, let me just share this. If, when you flood irrigate a field, about 65 to 80 percent of the water evaporates. Now, some of it obviously is absorbed into the soil and maybe comes back to you as groundwater at a later time. But and, and I suspect that some of the water that evaporates comes back to you as rain, but not necessarily where it where you need it. And and so when you use drip irrigation, if you're using um, subterranean drip irrigation, that is three inches or below the soil, there is zero evaporation, zero, from 65 to 80 percent to zero loss of water. And if you use surface uh, drip irrigation, you know, the kind that you sometimes see in gardens and such, you lose about four percent to evaporation. So, so just on the, it, let's be smart about how we use our water, that's an amazing choice. Now, in terms of around the world, let me share with you what I think is, I could talk about California, and maybe you want to, as a follow-up, I can, but let me tell you the most amazing place in the world, and that's India. India is in the midst of a water crisis. Its prime minister said a few months ago uh, at a ceremony involving my book 
that India's greatest single problem is not Pakistan, it's not religious uh, issues, it's not extremism, it's not terrorism, it is not even poverty. He said it is the possibility that we will run out of water. And there are as many as 600 million Indians who live over water systems that are threatened either because of intense pollution or because, they, frankly, the water is just given out. And so what India is doing now, it is in a race against time, it is subsidizing or giving loan guarantees to farmers all over the country to allow them to buy drip irrigation equipment and they pay it back generally in two to two and a half years based upon the increased yields that drip irrigation creates. Likewise for California, I mean, I think elite crops like grapes and uh, avocado and things like that, walnuts, pistachios, uh, almonds, of course, will use micro irrigation of some kind. But there's still lots of crops, cotton and alfalfa and, and commodity crops that do not. And they don't do it because water either isn't priced or there's historic rights to water or, or there's just, just no incentive to do so because the farmer is renting the land. And I think we need to change those incentives and make it easier for farmers to start using drip irrigation. Fascinating. Let's open it up to audience members. Would anybody have a question for Seth? We want to help him save his voice and feel better so we won't go on too long. Anybody? But while we find somebody to queue up, Seth, let me go back to your term that you uh, forwarded in your book, the hydro diplomacy term. Yes. Um, and you, you use that in, uh, in the context of Israel's successes. How could that translate into life in the United States and specifically Southern California? What could we be doing along those same lines? Well, look, I think just in terms of the Colorado River, um, you know, one of the things that strikes me is, is that an enormous amount of the water gets lost to evaporation along the flow of the Colorado. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate for smart, energy efficient desalination. And, um, and I think that there's a, 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 it's already good news and a lot more good news is coming. And I think that well, one of the things that you could think about is, is of the of the several states and also Mexico that are <coughs> sorry that are beneficiaries of uh, or users of the Colorado is that you could come up with more creative approaches rather than historic approaches. And one of which could be, for example, Colorado could pay to build a desalination plant in Southern California and then allow less or much less water to flow out of Colorado or Colorado, Arizona, and, and then have extra water available so that uh, paid for by the people of Colorado, but then made use of by the people of, uh, of Southern California. <coughs> In addition, you know, we have mostly harmonious relationships between the states, but there are lots of places around the world that do not. And I think that <coughs> with America as the guardian of the world, I think with America as the guardian of the world, we face a, a problem that we're going to be facing uh, c uh, conflict situations around the world now <coughs> if we're not careful. We're going to find ourselves in a situation, I think, quite soon where countries uh, like Iran, which I wrote an op-ed the other day for the Washington Post, Iran, um, Iran's own government believes that as many as 50 million out of 85 million Iranians may need to be relocated because they're running out of water. <coughs> this is reckless water, but you're also because of the damming of rivers <laughs> that other countries make, need to make use of. Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, all these countries are sharing <coughs> similar water systems, excuse me, <coughs> similar water systems, and um, you have the opportunity to, um, <coughs> the opportunity to um, figure out a way using U.S. leadership to uh, reduce the amount of f future conflict. You know what? I got to tell you, Seth, you have been heroic in not feeling well and powering through both your presentation and the questions. And we don't want to get in trouble with your wife. So we are going to allow you to recuperate and just let you know how much we appreciate your great presentation. We'll, we'll wrap it up there and wish you a speedy recovery. And thank you for really being a, a wonderful part of our day today. Thank you. I'm sorry those that queued up there, and I, I didn't want to see him suffer anymore. He was starting to perspire. I think his fever was returning, and I saw his wife's hand come in from screen left, ready to grab his throat. 
That was really spectacular. Give him another round of applause. All right, folks, our last session, Casting a Wider Net.